gets Lottie. Still has that takeover. Mo on a wrap! Dagger! Dagger! That's currently undefeated. That's in jeopardy right now. Up ahead of Mr. Style for three! Warriors Gaming Squad is your season two turn champions. What's going on, everyone? Today on Esports in 30, we be ballin', cause, well, that makes sense, right? Every day is a special episode. Now, normally on Tuesday, we have Ron and AJ here to talk Overwatch, but since the OWL is on a little break, we wanted to give them a well-deserved so nice. week off. We so nice over here. Plus, we're huge fans of our Toronto teams. I am, anyways. And our Toronto Raptors made the NBA Finals, so we figured why not take this day to talk about the NBA 2K League instead? Uh, this is related. I don't know. I'm definitely going to be cheering for the uh, Golden State Warriors. Why? So, Golden State Warriors, thank Marissa for an extra sale on a jersey that I'm going to wear here just to uh, I don't uh, be mean to her. I, I don't get it. Why? Because I don't like you. That doesn't I do make like any you. sense. Oh my god, that is so annoying. That just we're not we're done with unmuted, so like I can't even mute you right now, which is so irritating. Oh my god, you know what? <laughs> just whatever. Now the NBA 2K League is already halfway through its season, so we have a ton to catch up on. Thankfully, we not only have Jeff Eisenband calling in to break it all down, we have these highlights to get you hyped. Clock running down, under five now. Rooks at the free throw line to win it! <laughs> Pick it up from the field. We're talking about the Wizards, and there's a turnover. Up ahead, Reese the God. He'll take off and dunk all over Worthington Colt the third. Virtual refs, you gotta have a talk. It is what it is. The ball don't lie. What is this? Away. Don't foul him. We got a time ball again. Gets over to Shockey. You gotta get it to somebody that can shoot Shockey. Fade away. Oh my goodness. That might have been the dagger. Shock again. If he hits this, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm done. I'm dead. Two. One over the board. He's got his badge going. So let's get off of me. Gets it into Radiant. Two to shoot now. They get it to New Dini. Oh! Rux take it away. PP ball on the break. Mo. Lobs it up for Pete. Seven seconds to go. Compete right to the rack with a jam. Working against Lottie. Still has that takeover. Mo on a wrap. Dagger. Dagger, Dirk. Maddie. And one? Are you kidding me? Two point game. Compete. Oh, what a find a man on a mission. The no look dish. It's just up to Bear to make the read and get the pass off the play. JoJo takes his cookies and powers it down. They give it to Plondo. Back to Rooks for three for the tie. He got it. And Rooks is tied. The record for three pointers in a game. Five seconds now. Four, three, seam. Isolate. Locks it up for the win. Styles. Dimes running down. Gives it to PP Pollen for the win. Bucks currently undefeated. That's in jeopardy right now. Up ahead of Mr. Styles for three. Warriors Gaming Squad is your season two turn champions. The Warriors Gaming Squad won the turn, and Mavs Gaming sits atop the table, but there's so much more NBA 2K to be played before playoff time, and the door is still wide open to so many teams. Oh, now joining us to bring us up to speed with where the league is at, welcome to the show, NBA 2K League insider Jeff Eisenbent. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. We're halfway through the season, so mm -hmm. we got a lot to talk about here. Mm -hmm. Well, on the season then, you know, just for those that are unfamiliar with the NBA 2K League mm -hmm. and just the structure overall, can you give us just a quick rundown of what it's all about and how it works? Yeah, so uh, the league currently is uh, is in season two. It's 21 teams with 17 in season one. Uh, runs very similar to the NBA in itself in that there's a regular season and a, and a playoffs. Uh, there are also three other tournaments along with the playoffs, one before the season even starts and then two during the season. Uh, those add on to tiebreakers during for the playoffs. Mm -hmm. The t all 21 teams train there are they're owned by NBA franchises. Mm -hmm. They train, they practice, they live 
in their home cities. Regular season competition is in New York City. We've already had a tournament in Las Vegas, and we will have another tournament at a TBD location. TBD that I'm sure Jeff knows about, but can't show. Yeah, don't, can't worry spill the beans. don't worry about that. <laughs> a little winky wink. Listen, they say any press is good press, but perhaps the biggest headline that spread around the socials about the 2K League was the post-game altercation between the Hawks and Celtics. A lot of esports like the FGC or Gears of War are known for this trash talk and intense rivalries, and the NBA 2K League is as well, but how can the NBA 2K League keep that aspect of its identity while working to prevent altercations like this from happening again? Yeah, it was uh, it was an unfortunate situation. Um, you know, you get into the heat of the moment. There's a lot of competition in there. You're sitting right across from, uh, you know, the people that you're playing against. The NBA has made that a, you know, part of the the structure is having the the two teams sit across from each other and be able to to jot each other in a similar way to the actual NBA. Um, and it was just a, a little bit of a heat of the moment sort of thing. It was the uh, one of the players, actually two of the players, were suspended. Uh, there were fines handed out. Um, and I think the league is, has gotten past it, but mm -hmm. you know, you want that aspect of competition. You want the color of guys having fun with each other yeah. and going after each other and the mental aspect of the competition. It just needs to, when the, when the game is over, uh, that's it. You know, right. you move on. Yeah, yeah exactly. And that's what's so great about even Gears 2. Like, it's all in game. It all happens in game. The second it's over, they all shake hands. It's all love. Hey, that's how it was it, for it, us no, in, in no hockey chainsaws. Too. No chainsaws. No you know? chainsaws. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's whatever happens on the field happens on the field outside that. Mm. You go and uh, grab a drink together, right? Yeah. But, uh, anyways, I want to talk about the system um, before getting into the actual matches. So, uh, the way it works is there is you could protect two players coming off the offseason, mm. and then the rest were all drafted. Well, what are the positives and negatives of a system like this uh, where the majority of a team changes season to season? Mm. Yeah, I mean, you had, so you remember, you had 17, player, 17 teams in season one, six mm -hmm. players per team. So you're protecting two players, which essentially means that when the expansion draft happened, which mm -hmm. happened before the regular draft, you could take, uh, each team could take two, each of the four expansion teams got to draft two players from season one right away. You're essentially starting with the 35th best player. It was probably a little better mm -hmm. considering some teams had three top players. You know, you could argue it was more like the 28th mm -hmm. best player or so. So, you know, it's about creating a level of competition that is as equal as possible. You don't want these expansion teams coming in and being way, way behind the eight ball. So, yeah. um, you know, you had, and, and listen, the expansion teams are, so a couple of them are good this year. Nets and Hawks, two of them are, in the in the thick of the playoffs uh, race, the Timberwolves have done well in um, actual tournaments, but you don't want to create a situation where they're it's lopsided, where they're either becoming the best team or they're trailing from behind. You know, and you don't. I think the uh, Vegas Golden Knights have proved to everyone you have to be careful with the way an expansion draft is is uh, is created. Absolutely, yeah. love that comparison. So, in your mind, then, which teams were most affected by the redraft in both? Oh man, I mean, there were, there were a couple of teams, um, you know, I guess you could say negatively affected. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, uh, that's actually, it's a good point because the teams that you would think um, would have really taken a hit mm -hmm. um, didn't take, for example, the, the Blazers lost Daphoi Schatz, who was one of their best players, number uh, who was the first pick in the expansion draft. Uh, I'd say the Celtics were hurt by losing a player like Arsenal X. Uh, who I believe was, he was actually the last pick of the expansion draft, but just a guy who proved um, that he could have been used. And the Knicks, listen, the defending champion Knicks had a very tough decision. They had to protect two players. They had a deep team. They did not protect Nate Call, who was the NBA 2K League Finals MVP. He was picked immediately by, uh, by Nets GC, and they've done a great job this year. And although he is not a crazy scorer, he's a, he's a top-level defender, uh, he's a big reason, especially as a leader, why that team is in the playoff race right now. And frankly, the Knicks are not. I, I mean, yeah. in real life and in the game. <laughs> All right, let's talk, let's talk about the Mavs then, because actually, uh, they, uh, they actually are setting a record right now, nine wins in a row, mm. and that's the most in 2K history. What's helped the Mavs remain undefeated so far? Well, so the Mavs did, you know, the Mavs, everyone looked at the Mavs this offseason and thought, what are they doing? They were the only team that after protecting two players, they traded another player, and then there was another round of protections. The only player the Mavs kept from season one to season two was Dimes, who was the first overall pick in season one, kind of dubbed the LeBron James of NBA 2K before that draft. 
and a lot of people they traded Day Fry, who was a top player, was their second round pick. But a lot of people argued that he was the better player in season one anyway. Um, they broke down the entire roster. They had two first round picks. They made those picks. They, they picked PP Ballin and Mo, who have been two incredible players for them this year. They filled really the gaps they needed to. They drafted Sherm, a top level defender, and then got a couple guys in Rux and, and Grant, who were season one players who weren't protected by their initial team. So they had that veteran presence and they didn't play so well in the first tournament, but they just turned it on after that in the regular season. I think it's that balance. Uh, for those, for people that know basketball, uh, Mavs Gaming did a great job getting a point guard who could distribute, a small forward who could score, and a, and a center who could score and rebound. And basically that's the formula to be successful in NBA 2K. Mm. Um, we need to talk about the consistency here of Blazers 5, mm. 76ers, GC, both top teams from season one. Blazers 5, only one loss, 76ers, one tip off. So, mm. how do you explain the consistency of these two teams in light of the redraft? Well, I think incredibly well run franchises and both lost. Uh, players in uh, Blazer Blazer 5 losing Dapoy Shots and 76ers losing iFeast, uh, who went to T-Wolves Gaming. And it's a matter of, I mean, the Blazer 5 had two MVP finalists in season one, one Wild Walnut and Mom, I'm That Man. One Wild Walnut won last year. Mom, I'm That Man is probably gonna win MVP this year. Um, if not, Radiant on, seven, on the 76ers will probably win. These are just some of the top players in the world who you're starting with. And then just, just like I said, well-run organizations. Jeff Terrell is the coach at, seven, at the 76ers, runs an incredibly tight ship there. Uh, they practice hard. They practice right. They're prepped better than any team, I think, in the league. So they come in and they know their opponents so incredibly well. And they adjust in-game like no other team. The Blazers, it's just pure... I think it, it, there's some pure talent there with having two of the best players, one Wild Walnut and Mom, I'm That Man, paired together. It really doesn't matter how you add. They would tell you they really lost something with shots, and they've only lost one regular season game this year. They'd probably tell you they'd be 9-0. and um, and, and I think there's a fear aspect. Teams go into – they know how successful those two teams have been in two seasons. Everyone goes into that game thinking they'll lose, whether they say it or not. So mm -hmm. those are two d difficult teams to play. Well, let's let's talk about teams that didn't fare too well, obviously, from redraft here, because the defending champs are near last. Knicks are sitting near the bottom, and uh, similar to last year, but with uh, without that bracket spark. Do you see this Knicks team as having that same potential we saw last season, or did this uh, redraft really hurt them? You know, the redraft hurt them um, in terms of Nate Call, losing Nate Call. Uh, they felt like they picked up a guy, an original Malik, who could, you know, be a be a. Uh, at least add to that starting five, and they got a guy in Haza Hurst also who had played for, for the Mavs last year, and he's done a pretty well, good job filling in for the Knicks. They've lost a couple of close games. They're one and six. You could tell me they, they could easily be three or three and four or four and three right in it. Um, the problem is there's only 16 games, so when you're one and six through seven games, there's not a lot of time. I think that the, that the eighth seed in this playoffs is going to be 10 and six, so you're asking this team to run the table or do exactly what they did yeah. last year and win the team. Ticket. And I'm not going to say they're out of it. You know, the way that we've seen with, uh, I think Goofy's one of the best players in the league. He's their center. And then you're adding in a guy like I'm Adam the First and interest to go, who, guys who've, who've shown that they can just get hot like they did last mm -hmm. year. And I think Adam's coming on a little bit. Um, you know, I, I definitely think there was an aspect of they won. They were basking in their glory a little bit. I'm, uh, you know, could they have practiced a little more? Maybe there were some teams that really put in that offseason work, but. Um, you can't count them out from making a run, especially, you know how video games work. You play with your friends, you play with whoever, you get hot mm -hmm. and it's like five, you know, wins are reeled off so fast and the next thing you know, they're going to the playoffs again. So mm -hmm. pay attention because it could happen. I know we touched on the expansion teams briefly here, but I do want to get a little deeper into that because there's a big gap between them. The Hawks, Nets are, are top 10, T-Wolves, Lakers toward the bottom here. So what explains the gap between the top expansion teams and the bottom one? I think you're just talking about the different ways these two rosters were constructed. Mm -hmm. the, the Nets did, OG King Kurt went after high character guys and I created a deep lineup. I didn't think their skill was there at the beginning of the season. They've proven me wrong with their depth, I think, this year. Guys like Waby and Lav were two of their picks who um, have really come through big for them. With the Hawks, they drafted that boy shots in Arsenal right off the bat. Got a player like Brando um, in the actual entry-level draft. And 
the, that's a big three right there who have jumped right into competitiveness. But then you're looking at these teams at the bottom that have had roster issues. The Lakers made a trade in the offseason. They traded uh, the 10th overall pick to the Warriors for Vert. Uh, they got a guy who, is, who had proven himself in season one, but what they didn't get is CB13, who's been an outstanding point guard for the Warriors this year, a big part of the reason they won the turn. And then the T-Wolves, who got off to a great start in the first tournament in the season, the tip-off, had certain problems, internal problems with Hood, who was a player that they didn't even, they, they traded their expansion draft pick, O'Larry, to the Cavs for Hood. It didn't work out. They traded him about two weeks ago, so... They had to deal with their own issues. There, there's that still that team still has potential. They have a player in Bear to Beast who's a top, you know, if there was an all-star game, an all-star talent guy, but they just haven't figured it out. Uh, lost a couple, you know, games that they should games that you can't blow if you want to be in the playoff race. Right. Now, for me, the, the so the redraft system seems like it's there to to create balance over a few seasons, you know, as it goes on. Um, but obviously, if you add new teams, they're in for the first season. So what lessons can future teams learn coming into the league um, mm. to learn from the success and failures of these expansion teams mm. um, and just make sure they get it right from the beginning? Yeah, I think that um, I think that teams also have to realize there was a lot of reliance, not just expansion teams, but um, especially teams that were in the playoffs last year that basically uh, broke down their whole teams thinking that they could build themselves up in the entry draft. Uh, not even necessarily the expansion draft, but in the new play, you know, new player or mm -hmm. unprotected player draft, and they didn't find a lot of teams didn't find the talent that they thought was there. So you know, it, it's always like the grass is greener. There's a, a lot of teams that thought, oh, the best players in the world weren't necessarily in the league last year because of the combine process, the tryout process. It turned out. Most of the top players in the world were in the draft and were in the league in season one. Um, you know, you've added a few high level talents, but uh, you really you, you've struggled a little bit. The other thing is the game changes over time. Uh, the a lot of shooting guards in season one used the pure lock. The, excuse me, the pure shoot, um, pure sharp archetype, which was a very shooting based offensive archetype. This year, it's been a lot of the pure lock, which is a very defensive base based archetypes so you don't even know if you're what drafting a defender there. or a shooter sometimes and you just have to draft guys who have versatility right that makes sense um i want to talk about the turn here because gsw win yep. the mm -hmm. turn defeated heat mavs jazz and 76ers so walk us through the performance of the warriors gaming squad on route to winning the turn it, almost contradictory to what i just said yeah. part of what the the way the warriors constructed their team they were terrible last year bottom of the league um, they kept two guys in type and be smooth who had really shown potential. They traded Vert um, to get those first, those early picks at two and 10. Uh, they drafted Gradient and CB13. They drafted Jin, a player who had been with the Wizards later on. And of course, Chiquita, the first woman player in the NBA 2K League. They're almost too deep. They're that good. Um, they they brought in uh, a coach in Tommy Ab. Ab I'm going to botch his name, but Abdenor, um, Abnador, who came in. We probably can do better. So. I, he'll, he'll, get, he'll tell me in person. <laughs> but, um, but they've done an incredible job of creating this roster from the bottom up and creating a roster that a lot of people said at the beginning of the season, there's a lot of potential for this team. Uh, I think that the young guys needed to gel a little bit. Those rookies, they're 19 years old the first uh, few weeks. And all of a sudden, they came to the turn. And the turn, by the way, for those who don't know, in the NBA 2K League, you choose for each position, you choose uh, between five archetypes, what you want to use. Mm -hmm. And part of the way the turn worked was that the uh, teams had the ability where every team would ban an archetype before the game for both teams. So when you'd play an actual game, two of the archetypes would be banned. Mm -hmm. So certain teams adjusted and certain teams didn't because the Warriors had so much depth. That's where I think they were able to succeed because they didn't that you couldn't just ban one player and feel like you're taking them away. They would just go on to the next guy. So it was an incredibly difficult, you know, situation to defend and that's what won the Warriors and they've actually got they say they've gotten better because they learned they could play on other archetypes because they were forced to do so mm -hmm. so now you've got a team that can throw anything out at you there's a lot of strategy involved because you don't know the archetypes until the tip off yeah, you actually mentioned Jaquita. I wanted to, uh, she's making headlines right now. I just wanted you to maybe um, just talk about uh, her impact on the NBA 2K League right now um, and what it means just in the greater landscape of everything. Mm -hmm. I think one of the coolest things about esports is that we do have more of a co-ed approach to it as opposed to traditional sports. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I tell people all the time, you know, the the one of the part of the beautiful thing about esports is that the barrier for entry is equal for everyone. All mm -hmm. you have to do is have the console system, and um, you know, I think that there are obvious numbers that less women play NBA 2K in most video games than than men, but. Uh, Chiquita has done an amazing job navigating this world, especially last year there was uh, the NBA 2K League invited four women to come to a showcase that was kind of a celebrity game. Mm -hmm. And she was one of the four and she impressed a lot of people. She mm -hmm. came out on that stage where the real players play um, and she impressed a lot of people and I think that helped her profile. She kept uh, playing on the pro-am scene got through the combine and when she got drafted there listen there were a lot of people that said oh the warriors are just doing this for the image mm -hmm. you know they drafted her in the fourth round of four rounds she'll sit on the bench they'll parade her around and now she's played three games she's proven that she has the ability you know the ability to be here and i think that um you know she's getting interviewed everywhere she goes um but she's carried herself you know she keeps her energy up i know that all she really wants to do is play but she recognizes just how big she is for people out there and for just proving to people it's such an ignorant um, you know thought process to think that women can't compete in elite level esports it's the same game for everyone that's um, the thing about esports you prove yourself just, right you, yeah, that and you see when she shows up whether we were in Vegas or you know at the studio in New York people mm -hmm. come and they see her and they're inspired so it's mm -hmm. awesome yep. I mean there's been a lot of talk about this recently as well just on Twitter as there always is with women uh, competing in different leagues of course but um, a lot of the talk kind of sort of center around the fact that like women can actually play they can and then once they get to this field they they can but the second they are able to join a team of all males the men don't seem to accept them as much as maybe they should because they liked having a, a bro school a bro squad they like just being together with the boys and it's hard to include a woman into that like have you seen any of that with her with her team at all do you feel like everyone seems to be getting along because it is also hard oh, seeing yeah. a woman getting all this attention too when everyone else is playing just as good if not better than her I think the Warriors and like I said coach Tommy and Rustin who's the GM there have done a, an incredible job just um, you know they bought in to something that other teams didn't and I think we know how successful the Golden State Warriors organization is on the NBA side this is not a slacker organization this is this is not just someone that drafted you know Chiquita and said all right guys everyone get along it was you know we're doing this here's what we're doing you know we we are gonna carry ourselves like this and we're gonna win a championship this year and I think that they've done you know they have two of the, I don't know if more mature is the way to put it, but they're two leaders and the guys they protected type and be smooth carry themselves as two of the bigger guys in the NBA 2K league. And, you know, there's that sense of, like I said, you, you can tell these, some of these teams run a tight ship yeah. and the Warriors run a tight ship. Nothing's, no, if they have any problems, nothing's getting out there. Yeah. Um, and I don't think they do when they win the turn and they win $90,000 and stuff like that. Yeah. They're, they're very happy right now. But I think it starts with the NBA 2K League, two things. One, they're, they're, they, these teams have coaching staffs. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Warriors coaching staff in particular comes from the Warriors organization. Tom, Coach Tommy mm -hmm. is the video, uh, works for the G League team. So he crosses over and he deals with uh, high-level athletes on a common basis and then you're just uh, you know you're just dealing with uh, guys that a uh, team that handles themselves appropriate knows what they're doing knows what the goal is and I just don't think you see those problems right now mm, no I mean I mean and, and, and in basketball I, I would just add in basketball that me, me, you know growing up a lot of these kids played basketball and you're used to playing with the women's team you know if you yeah. play m boys high school basketball especially in the u.s mm -hmm. the girls team is practicing right next to you and you have that relationship with them mm -hmm. for sure and like obviously all of this really comes down to maturity and, and you're right like because they have those two players that are great staples in the community and they are much more mature they they have a good head on their shoulders i feel like it's easier to welcome a woman into a, the squad with that mentality all right, uh, let's talk about uh, just the fact that you guys are, are moving around now. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the turn was played yes. in Vegas. Uh, take it outside the studio. How did it feel to take the NBA 2K League on the road? Oh, it was awesome. I mean, these, uh, first of all, from the players themselves internally, they had, you know, huge eyes. Seeing Vegas, seeing uh, HyperX Esports Arena in Vegas, seeing the, um, 
the West Coast teams were especially happy that they didn't have to fly to New York. They had to fly to Vegas. Um, but it was just, uh, it was it was an eye-opening experience, I think, for the league and everyone around it to see that there are these other places. You know, now I think it's so easy to just, you just got to bring some of your game. Um, but the, the technology, a lot of the production staff is just there and waiting. And Esports Arena in itself has that extra sort of, you know, there's no... There's no bar and restaurant at the mm -hmm. NBA 2K League in New York, a studio in New York. There's um, the, the stadium seating, the players are looking directly at the crowd was a little different than looking at each other. Um, the, the idea of, I think that there was a, a professional aspect of, for the NBA 2K League studio in New York, it almost feels like home for these guys to, this felt like, it, it's there. weird saying it as, as a road trip because basically every trip is a road trip for them, but it felt, um, you know, like a little more, I think teams were a little more locked in just because they were in this new arena. They're practicing. I'm sure you guys have been out there practicing in the HyperX arena, you know, practice rooms, which are a little different. You see the pyramid when you roll up. It just felt like that. And there, were, there was definitely a crowd of, uh, you know, you take it on the road. There's people who aren't usually there, whether they're, yeah. um, you know, actually in the crowd or whether there are people in the business that are seeing this spectacle for the first time. It's a new atmosphere, entirely new atmosphere. Yeah, I want to talk a little bit more about the future of NBA 2K League. Uh, we only have about a minute left here with you with another uh -oh. expansion team confirmed in the Hornets for the next year. What do you see as the future of the 2K League? Like, do you see a full 30 team league within, within a few years? Yeah, oh, oh, definitely. And I think, you know, you look at the G League, very similar. There's still two teams that don't have G League teams. Um, it's all a business side mm -hmm. of the things for these NBA franchises. So you got the initial 17, 21. We'll see us keep inching closer to 30. Uh, the Hornets, like you said, are in. There's been some smoke about a few other teams. I can't really say which, but mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, there's definitely an interest from a lot of teams that recognize what's going on. I think that, like we just talked about Vegas, uh, it's recognizing mm -hmm. that this league is going to and I said there'll, there'll be a third location. Will there be a tournament this year? I'd say you got three locations this year. You know, maybe you go a few more next year. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll keep growing. Obviously, Overwatch League is something that uh, you have to imagine that the league is looking at and seeing how can we get a Absolutely. localized form of everything going on and when philadelphia is building a 5,000 person arena and this city you know each city is building something new and i don't know if you guys have seen what mark cuban did with the with the dallas mavericks maps gaming is ready to go they mm -hmm. have a, uh, already have um basically a mini arena you know these, these i'm not saying these are going to be home arenas are going to be you know, like that that arena in Philly, that's 5,000. I'm not saying that's where yeah, NBA yeah. 2K leagues are going to play, but uh, you can create definitely home city sort yeah, of doing it. Um, atmospheres and, and do, um, you know, do series and stuff along that line. So there's a reason that this league has started with, um, you know, keeping those teams localized mm -hmm. and building a presence in the community. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Mr. Insider, Jeff, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to call in and uh, give us all the details on the digital court. See you around, buddy. No problem. Tune in Wednesday, Thursday, Friday nights. Regular season starts at 6 p.m. Eastern time each night. Ah, oh, Jeffy. All right, I got. I do now that he's gone and what? he can't say anything uh, about us. I, I'm gonna get my opinion out there. So going back to the beginning of our conversation with Adam, obviously we brought up um, that altercation that happened. Yes. Um, you know, there's a bit of a, uh, a, a little, little tiff. huff and tough going on between some of the players there. I, I like how you say it as if like you would be tougher in that scenario. You would not. Oh no, I didn't. What? I never once said that. Oh, cool. I'm just saying. Okay. I kind of think that's good. I mean. A lot of people didn't, may not even known that these this esports going on. You know, this is uh, the way that the NBA is approaching this is a little different than other esports. Mm. Um, but it, it's not. It doesn't have as much traction as you know. Obviously, the bigger esports, the tier ones, yeah. and that like CS:GO and stuff. But um, I think this that stuff can help it. I mean, the reason that we see a lot of gears clips is because of you know all the trash talk and stuff. Yeah. And then people get into it and they love it. And you see this clip taking its uh, making its way around the internet about two players kind of getting on each other's faces. Mm. That happens in, you know in real sports. And it's like where 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 is the field? You know we talked about uh, you know on the on the field have at her, but then outside the field yeah. let everything go. They're still in the stadium. Is that not the field? So I feel like that should still be a part of the field. That is the broadcast. Sure. You should still be popping off that point. You got an issue? Get up in each other's faces. And I feel like that actually could help 
those but, okay, leaks, you know? Right, yeah, but I mean, there was pushing and shoving there, and that, that that's when the line gets stepped over, right? Like, it's one thing to exchange words, it's one thing to mm. have, you know, some salt put on your opponent there, because that's a lot of fun. You and I do it all the time yep. in Unmuted, and You're that's stupid. what makes it. The sh <laughs> shut up. You're supposed to be professionals in esports and 30. <laughs> uh, no, but then once you once you get physical, that's when it, it no longer is okay. In my opinion, it's, it's no longer okay. And then like we, we compare it to Gears of War and we compare it to FGC, mm -hmm. but these are scenes that have, have remained steady with their viewership. They haven't really climbed in a few years here. So with that being said, maybe maybe this isn't actually helping their esport. Maybe, maybe a more mature stance, maybe keeping it out of it might actually be a good thing. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, there, there could be deeper problems there when it comes to the actual games. Like, mm. people just don't want to watch oh. Gears of War. That that could be a situation. But it's, it's like, fun to watch I, it, so at that point, you got to do something. You know, what, do you think the NBA is ever going to get to a point where they're like, hey, you know, this isn't gaining as much traction as we thought it would? to start doing some of that stuff, like, you know, know, allow a little bit of more rowdiness and trash talk to happen, hey. and be kind of that, uh, you know, grassroots, like, you know, street ball kind of thing, you know, you're out in the streets and just like, you know, av just giving her, who cares just, out there, right? Just giving her, just giving her, just sending it. Uh, yeah, but the thing is, like, if we're comparing this to the actual NBA, so comparing this esport to actual sports, the NBA has a lot of drama within it too, but that stuff happens, like, on Twitter later, that stuff happens, sure, mm -hmm. you get you get a little rowdy on the court too, because it's but, exciting to watch, we love seeing that drama, so there's there's good and bad to to this whole scenario, I just don't like the shoving. But he was he was even saying, you know, that Twitter is actually where it shouldn't go to. Oh, no, that's it off, definitely that's should go to Twitter. Off. No, you love that. I I love but, it. <laughs> that's off the court now, though. That is actually off the court and away from it. I think if it's going to happen, it's got to be on the court, man. Oh, but not man. like tweeting at each other on the court. Actually saying stuff to each other in court. I, I want it. I just got to say. Keep it there. Tease a little bit on Twitter <laughs> to get us to come in and watch the game later on the exact same times that Jeff promoted. To see the, the fight. The yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to see them fight. I mean, why not? Hey, uh, Brody, a pleasure. Chatting some NBA 2K League with you today, buddy. Just like that, we are out of time. But thank you to NBA 2K Insider Jeff Eisenman for calling in. And thank you at home for watching. Next week, Ron and AJ are back to preview stage three of the Overwatch League. And of course, we have three more awesome shows for you this week. Till then, we'll see you next time.